Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruijt and I'm the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation. And at the end of the presentation, we'll have time to address these questions and comments. So today's talk is titled the retrospective of the Rift Valley Network webinar series year one by Andrew Harvey and Richard Griscom. Uh, Andrew is a research fellow at the Leiden University Center for Linguistics. Uh, the title of his current funded research is Gorba, Hatsa and Ihanzu, Grammatical Inquiries in the Tanzanian Rift Valley. Um, his interests include the languages of the Tanzanian Rift, their documentation and description, their formal verbal syntax, and the histories and cultures of their speaker communities. Richard is a postdoc at the Leiden University Center for Linguistics. He specializes in the documentation of endangered languages and functional typological linguistic description, with emphasis on the languages of East Africa and the development of digital fieldwork methods. He is currently focusing on the documentation of Hatsa, a language isolate of northern Tanzania. Um, so the presentation today will be presented by Andrew, so please join me in welcoming him as he gives his presentation. Well, hello, I'm uh, Andrew Harvey, and on behalf of my co-author, Richard Griscom, I'd like to welcome you to our talk today. Um, as, a, as a procedural uh, note, uh, I am uh, currently uh, very far from the Tanzanian Rift Valley area. I'm uh, in COVID-19 related quarantine in rural Newfoundland. I'm not ill, but if my internet connection with you is patchy at all, this is the reason why. Um, inconveniences aside, today's talk marks approximately one year since we as a research network decided to begin having online live presentations, webinars, as well as recording them and uh, making them openly available online. So as such, this talk takes a look back at the first year of the Rift Valley webinar series with the intent of exploring common themes in Rift research and possibilities for the future. As mentioned in our prolegomenon, the first presentation in this year's series, the webinars were envisioned as providing a platform for Rift Valley Network members to share re research and to develop conversations about the Rift Valley area. Um, this year's webinars series featured 21 presentations whose cumulative length, including questions and answers, was 17 hours. For comparison, uh, the last colloquium of African languages and linguistics, as venerable a gathering on African linguistics as there is, feature give or take 50 presentations and a cumulative length of around 25 hours. Because our webinars are all openly accessible online after they're given, um, their use goes beyond the live presentation. So online metrics tell us that our webinars have been watched for around 70 hours on YouTube. That's an average of each presentation being watched in its entirety around four times. And our webinars have been downloaded around 60 times from our online archives in Odo. I think that this is strong evidence that there is interested in the research that we are generating as a group. In a breakdown of the presentations by the main language they treat, we see a five, uh, we see five apiece for the Southern Nilotic language uh, Datoga and the South Cushitic Iraq Gorwa, two each for the Eastern Nilotic Ma uh, or Maasai, um, the putatively Khoisan Sandawe, the Bantu uh, language Ihanzu, and the isolate Hadza. I'm also happy to see the Bantu language Kimbu represented here. I think the very first time it has been presented on in a linguistics context. And to a large extent, these proportions are a reflection of the current interests of the majority of Rift Valley Network members, be they the interests of new scholars, such as Kuriam Doe in his treatment of Datoga nouns, um, or uh, projects of established figures, such as Martin Mouse's discussion of the complex nature of imperfective verb forms in Iraq. Um, new languages of interest are also represented. Ihanzu, for example, had previously received little attention in the existing literature, but was the subject of two presentations this year, including Stanislav Bolesky's detailed descriptive account of demonstrative pronouns. In addition to Datoga, South Cushitic, and F Group Bantu, this year's webinar series also featured two talks given on Ma, or Maasai, 
a language or group of language varieties not typically considered a Tanzanian Rift Valley language. The talks by Doris Payne and Michael Karani both draw our attention to the internal variation present in this large language we label collectively as Ma, and in a way compel us to reconsider its status. If, after all, the variety or varieties of Ma which we which were or are in contact with those languages uh, we consider canonical members of the area are undocumented, uh, there's really no way to know yet how much or how little they've contributed to contact. So this is an interesting uh, argument made in both of these presentations and I think will reflect, uh, uh, will, will affect how we, how we view Rift Valley languages in the Rift Valley area in the future, both, both methodologically in terms of the samples of languages that we take, but also in terms of our research agenda, what should be documented and what we need to look at. Um, the presentations labeled other uh, filled sort of stock taking functions reflecting on our past work, such as Richard and my uh, prolegomenon or introducing new tools, such as Richard, Jeremy, and my introduction to the Rift Valley bibliography. Um, in addition uh, to, the to those languages covered this year, I'll also mention the languages not covered. We received no treatment of the Bantu languages Rangi, Mbugwe, Nyilamba, or Nyaturu, or if we are being uh, thorough, Sukuma, as well as no dedicated treatments of, um, of the South Cushitic languages Alagwa or Burungay. So researchers looking for rich potential subjects of investigation do take note. Uh, also uh, absent is any treatment of Asakh, Kwadza, or any of the other so-called Dorobo languages, languages of communities that have been or are being subsumed by other groups. Though my co-author Richard promises a presentation on his fieldwork with Omayo Dorobo in the near future. I mean, it's understandable that these languages would feature less prominently in current research. The context surrounding their study, uh, as Richard would attest, is difficult. Um, but with that said, a solid understanding of the Dorobo languages would do a great deal in contributing to our understanding of language dynamics, uh, language endangerment, and language change in the rift. So I would encourage uh, work on the Dorobo languages. Um, it was briefly mentioned uh, that uh, above, but it should be explicit, made explicit here, that when we refer to Dotoga or Ma, we are really dealing with groups or complex continua of language varieties. Uh, this is something addressed, for example, in Griscom 2019A, which you'll see in the references. And these classifications obscure this. So that should be sort of noted here that we're dealing with dialect or, or variety continua. So in the prolegomenon given at the start of this year's webinar series, we reviewed past literature on the languages of the Tanzanian Rift and noted two co-committant and complementary movements, that of a strong history of traditional pursuits, description, analysis, and historical work, and more recently, an exciting expansion of research foci, uh, there, this latter impulse springing from and often rooted in the former. One good example of strong work in the former tradition is represented in uh, the continuation of vital descriptive work uh, carried out on Rift languages this year. Uh, Kiesling's uh, treatment of verbal inflection in Datoga being a good example of this. Uh, an example of a more abstract kind of foray into the descriptive tradition is my own attempt to account for Goa word order in the minimalist framework. Uh, and you know, the kinds of description we can conduct depends on the kind of data that we have. So with years of texts and a solid command of the language, work on so-called higher modalities of language can begin. So Helen Eaton's treatment of clause linkage in Sandawe is an example of the kinds of description that can arise from data rich in examples larger than a single phrase. And uh, I would hope that we can see analyses that are driven by these larger um, data sets and, and more natural and uh, more linked uh, speech as well. And I think that Helen's uh, presentation is a particularly strong example of that. Um, this year saw uh, two descriptive presentations on a single topic, uh, so-called impersonal constructions, one by Richard Griscom on Southern Nilotic and one by Martin Mouse on South Cushitic. 
These presentations spent some time speaking to each other, discussing the possibilities of contact being the cause of the existence of this similar feature across two different phyla. Uh, but largely, contact was ruled out as a possible reason. Though, of course, this hasn't been, uh, this hasn't been uh, put into a formal publication yet, and I think it's worth looking at, uh, but I think it's the start of a very interesting conversation, a kind of template of conversations that could go on in the descriptive work. Among the themes emerging from expanded research foci, we see language documentation uh, as figuring prominently. Agostino Caguema's talk introduces his planned documentation of Kimbu, laying out details of how this could be done, as well as why such work is of particular importance now. Indeed, given improvements in recording technology, as well as the endangerment status of many of the languages or speech genres of the Tanzanian Rift Valley area, I would argue that such a theme is particularly relevant to our collective work. We see also analyses of socio-cultural and political uh, language dynamics, uh, particularly detailed in uh, Jeremy Coburn's talk on the vulnerable status of the Hadza language and uh, traditional culture. Um, Alice Mitchell's 2019 talk on one group of young siblings in the Yaeda Valley is a unique and I would say in many ways revolutionary way of researching and depicting language, language contact and the elements through which that is mediated. And such fine-grained data is, to me, a new window to understanding essential forces at play in the Tanzanian Rift Valley area. And the methodology deserves to be replicated in sites across our area of interest. Um, this year's webinar series saw two treatments of the linguistics of names and naming, with Amani Lusakello reflecting on how Hadza names and naming is associated with contact, endangerment, and identity, and Crispina Alphonse providing a detailed typology founded on detailed ethnographic knowledge as well as personal insight on this practice in South Cushitic. In commenting on future prospects for research and understanding of the Tanzanian Rift Valley area, I'd like to return to Kiesling Mouse and Nurse's 2008 treatment which to an extent provided the impetus for forming the current Rift Valley network. Early on in this chapter, they identify the Tanzanian Rift Valley area as a unique laboratory for the study of language contact, uh, as the languages here have clearly been in contact for a long time. And because many of the languages come from distinct phyla, it is in principle easier to tease out what phenomena are due to contact and what phenomena are due to internal innovation, et cetera. Taking a step back, not only are the languages of the Rift Valley remarkably different, but so too are the cultures of their speaker communities. And so therefore, the nature of interactions, relationships, and therefore the type of contact is remarkably diverse. And this is not trivial in that the present day distribution of linguistic features uh, across the languages of the Tanzanian Rift Valley area, some of which is discussed in Kiesling Mouse and Nurse 2008, it can't sufficiently be explained by traditional linguistic analysis alone. The distribution of these features has been conditioned by social factors. And so to truly understand the languages of the Rift and uh, the great historical, cultural, and human epic they belie, we need to develop a deeper understanding of the social contexts in which language contact occurred. What was, for example, the Dorobo Maasai relationship uh, like in which contact occurred? What was the Azamjeg and Bajuta relationship in which contact occurred? What was the Datoga Iraq um, relationship in which contact occurred? What was the Iraq Gorwa relationship in which contact occurred? What was the Ihanzu? Hadza contact uh, relationship. And all of these uh, configurations and more can be analyzed and, and, and they can really open up windows of understanding and frames in which we can analyze uh, our contact. And some of this has been uh, begun by Roland Kiesling uh, um, talking about the historical, um, the historical um, uh, social dynamics behind contact 
or behind language change in South Cushitic. Um, but I think that really this is sort of a very fecund area and I think vital to our understanding of the area if this is, if this is really our, our, our stated research interest. Some starting questions we should possibly consider are, where are the speakers of these languages now? We have, um, we have a, a sort of starting um, uh, graphic with this. I think the best exists in the languages of Tanzania um, uh, language atlas, but I think that we can probably do much better given, uh, given that these communities now are more highly mobile. We have, uh, we have communities that are mixed. I think, that, uh, I think that this sort of work, being able to map out where languages are spoken exactly um, would really move us forward. And of course, then the extension of that is where were they in the past? And of course, this opens up questions of uh, human migration and past contact, of which some we can answer using linguistics and some we would have to answer using other branches of science, I would say, such as archaeology um, and, uh, and uh, delving into things like the oral histories. Um, I think that these are important things. We need to be able to establish chronologies or at least rel uh, relative chronologies of the movements of people and their contacts. This is very important for the work that we're going to be doing. I think it's important that we have these sort of standard or um, uh, you know, uh, rigorously argued uh, chronologies for the area. Um, a, a second sort of question is, is what are or were the social factors conditioning the distribution of linguistic features in the rift? I, I mentioned this, but this is important. Very often we talk about things like, you know, it, it's often given, okay, inter, intermarriage, and then we have imperfect speakers are, 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 are calcing forms. Uh, from their old language onto the new language, and that is what the children learn. But we have to remember that we have very diverse, um, you know, this is, this is complicated by, um, by uh, differing patterns of, um, of um, differing social patterns uh, within different uh, linguistic communities. So we have a lot of the F group Bantu practice matriliney. Um, uh, the Cushitic groups are largely patrilineal. We have weak matrilineal uh, patterns in Hadza, for example. Uh, we have strong patrilineal and patrilocal examples in Datoga. So how do these systems, we, we talk about intermarriage and, and, and really, I mean, that's, it's, it's a complex factor and these are things that we should understand. And linguistics uh, has a role to play in this as well. Kinship terms, you know, reconstructing these terms, understanding how they're different or how they're the same, how, how kinship terms have been borrowed across different languages all could lend us insight um, into, into this particular uh, social factor. Um, and there's more to that. We've talked about the rise of dream prophets such as Sagilo Magena, creating larger, uh, creating larger conceptions that are, that are larger than this sort of rather stultified conception of tribe or ethnic group. Um, and we have uh, we have uh, we have historical and environmental factors such as famine uh, causing widespread movement of people and breakdown of political systems. All of these things, you know, it, it's incredibly important that we understand them to get a full understanding of, of how language contact occurred. Um, and then, of course, we have which kinds of speakers were uh, and are engaged in what kinds of interactions. And I'll mention uh, Alice's presentation again in, in, in that it's fascinating in that she deals with. Um, young children, and we often, uh, you know, obviously it's taken for granted that young children play a part in contact, but actually studying what comes out of their mouths and, and how they interact with, with the environment around them. In Alice's case, the, the, the universe of the, of the Datoga compound, uh, the boma on which they were born and grew and, and, and learned their language, uh, this this all uh, is, is yet to really be understood in any sort of rigorous or um, or you know um, structured way. So these are very exciting sort of edges at which we can sort of pull to try and expand our understanding of the Tanzanian rift. And you know achieving any of these answers is sort of predicated on several basic resources that we as a research network are still lacking. Uh, I would argue that we still lack really sort of a common empirical basis. I think it's, I think, I can't really stress this enough, I think, and that openly accessible um, data is very, very important. Uh, being able to link examples to existing corpora of recordings, I think, could really move our, uh, our work on the area forward. 
um, being able to access each other's material and listen. And I know that a lot of us have, have made some very big moves uh, towards this. I, and I realize that it takes an awful lot of work, but this is something that uh, I think would, uh, would really uh, bring us forward in a, in a large way uh, in our understanding and in our work on uh, the Rift Valley. So openly accessible linguistic data and being able to link our examples to existing corpora. Another, um, another tool that, uh, that is, uh, that is uh, something that would really help uh, move forward our uh, study of the rift, our riftology, as we say, are our reconstructions of, of proto-languages. So we have a very, uh, we have a very uh, good sort of solid reconstruction of uh, proto-South uh, Cushitic that was done uh, in the last decade by uh, Roland Kiesling and Martin Maus. Uh, and uh, we can see now that Martin Maus is uh, reconstructing um, linguistic history in East Africa uh, project is attempting to go further back, which is a, a welcome development and very exciting indeed. Um, but of course, we 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 see we see other uh, attempts, such as, uh, for example, arriving at a, a proto rangi Mbugwe or um, uh, closer to the kind of uh, languages that I work on, a proto a proto Ihanzu Nyilamba or a proto Ihanzu Nyilamba Mbugwe or proto uh, uh, Ihanzu Nyilamba and um, and Rimi, for example, um, these would all be very important. Um, a proto Dotoga, if it is all possible, um, these sort of reconstructions would really help us understand um, understand um, sort of the predecessor groups, where they were, how they were different, and if uh, and if there was contact even at that point. Um, and then, of course, we, we can talk about the sort of the technical means of comparison. How do we how do we compare uh, even lexical forms between uh, these different languages and language groups? Right now, it requires uh, going into dictionaries or the various lexica of what we have, uh, many of which uh, many, many languages uh, we don't have. Or are uh, or are underdocumented, are lacking the appropriate detail to uh, properly uh, compare. Um, I, I think about I think about the F thirty Bantu, for example. Uh, a lot of the material was produced over, you know, fifty uh, years ago, and a lot of the material is not tone marked. I think that these these are important um, details. Um, yes, and, 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 and finding ways to compare, okay, so the lexical items, but also the grammatical features. How can we possibly design a tool in which, uh, we, can, in which we can compare a grammatical feature, such as impersonals in uh, Datoga and Iraq, or, uh, or, um, or ventive constructions, for example? All of these are desiderata, and I think that they would move our, uh, our understanding of the rift forward and our work uh, forward considerably. Um, this sort of brings me to the end of uh, what I had to say today. Before I move on and say, uh, say thank you for listening to the presentation, I would like to first um, really thank all of the contributors who have contributed to our webinar series. Um, I think for this to be useful and for this to uh, exist, um, it, it really it really depends on the uh, on, on on the genius and the continued uh, contribution of our members. So uh, I would like to thank everybody for their contributions in the past year. And uh, the next presentation will mark the first presentation in the 2020-2021 uh, webinar series. And I'm very excited uh, to see that uh, continue. Um, so thank you very much uh, for listening to this uh, brief. Uh, overview and uh, I look forward to your questions. Here are our references. Thank you a lot, Andrew. Um, I am sure there's gonna be plenty of comments, but to give everyone some time to write, uh, I'm just gonna start with a question of my own. Uh, I'm also particularly interested in getting comparable research uh, with stimuli, which would be more easily comparable between different language families, but also within families. Uh, do you have any plans for the future, which you would like to do maybe in an archive or a corpora or something like that, or is it more abstract at this point? Right, it's kind of it's kind of more abstract at this point for me, Anna. Because, uh, but I suppose one thing that we can sort of 
one sort of basic starting point is for us to do these basic documentations. This is a reason why um, Augustino's, uh, Augustino Caguema and Michael Carani's work has been very exciting that they, in that they've been proposing these sort of um, large, rigorous language documentations that will be openly um, archived. Um, and uh, I think that these are excellent starts uh, for being able to access sort of these standard um, repositories of data that we can agree, okay, this was work that was done on Kimbu at a certain time in a certain place uh, by a trained linguist. Um, this is the material that they received from speakers. And, and then researchers of any stripe um, and any persuasion can examine that. And, uh, and more importantly, or maybe even just as importantly, when we are writing papers or when I'm writing a paper on Ihanzu or on Gorwa, if um, I, I give an example and, and it strikes somebody's fancy, they can go back and they can listen to it and they can find com comparable examples. So this is in terms of the empirical basis. I think that that's really important to mention. Um, I, think it's, I think it's a real desideratum right now that we try and build these, uh, these, um, these openly accessible corpora of uh, Rift Valley languages. I think that these will really be the backbone of any sort of future work that we do, and they can be built. They don't need to be the they don't need to be the be all end all. They can continue to grow, and they can be contributed to by future researchers. Um, you know, so it's not that we need to go out and make the authoritative recordings of of all of Rangi or all of Mbugwe. Um, it's to go out and to make an effort now, so we can have some natural language data. Um, that we can rely on in the future. Uh, so we can get things like tone and we can get things like gesture and we can get things like um, um, like join speech to do uh, the work that um, Helen has done, for example, in her uh, clause linkage in Sandawe. Um, another thing is, is simply is, is finding a is finding a, a form of software where we, where we can compare lexical items across uh, across um, languages. Um, I can't remember, and uh, Richard might be able to remind me of the software that Martin is uh, planning on employing to compare lexical items across Cushitic. Uh, there, there's a particular um, piece of software that he will be using uh, to compare uh, lexical items, and, and its name has escaped me right now. Um, but, but this would be useful. It would be useful to maybe input, uh, try and input all of the lexical items that we have for the Rift Valley languages. Um, I was really struck by Michael Karani's presentation the other day as sort of an offhand example. Um, the word for a light drizzle in two of the varieties of Maasai that he was mentioning is atibitipi, something like this, of, of, that, for, of, of, of that sort of, um, ilk atibitibi, something like that, for a light drizzle. And the word for water in, in Hadza is, is atibi. So I find, that, I find that very, very striking, given that we, we, we don't right now have any sort of, um, we don't have any sort of um, uh, attestation of, of large or continued contact between uh, Hadza and Maasai, but but you know just finding just finding an offhanded word like that might provide impetus for a closer look. Ah, Richard reminds me the uh, or or Ahmed reminds me. Thank you, Ahmed, um, of the uh, of the software that that uh, that um, uh, Martin Mouse is making use of right now. It's called Reflex, and you enter in uh, lexical items from different uh, languages or different language varieties, and you can easily compare across that. Uh, database. So that's quite exciting. Um, so these are these are pieces of, of software and obviously it's a lot of work to do but these are these are tools that we could very well use. Interesting, thank you. Um, so I have a question from Alice Mitchell. She asks, is anyone working on Sukuma? I think you're right to emphasize that this is an important piece in the puzzle potentially spreading widely as a language around Tanzania. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, it wasn't really until I started work with Ihanzu uh, that I realized that Sukuma was such a, um, a constant uh, presence in uh, our neck of the woods. I know it was mentioned kind of parenthetically in Kiesling Mouse and Nurse uh, 2008, but I think it's really it's really about time to kind of um, uh, to kind of put 
uh, Sukuma uh, or consider it in, in, as, a, as a Rift uh, Valley language, I think it would be very, very uh, interesting. And I think it would add a lot to our understanding, um, both from a linguistic point of view, but also from a cultural point of view. I know that the Sukuma sent tributes to the, uh, to the Datoga dream prophet Sagila Magina. So clearly, and, and they sent uh, salt caravans to Lake Iasi as well. So clearly there were, um, so clearly there were, there were connections with uh, this Rift Valley cultural and linguistic area. So I think that these are very important. Uh, yes, uh, Lutz mentions that Herman Batibu, Batibo did some work on um, Sukuma, did considerable work on Sukuma, the phonology of the language um, in the 80s. And uh, more recently, actually, my classmate at the University of Darpeji Lunyili. Uh, and uh, I, know that, I know that in Tanzania, they do produce uh, master's dissertations and also uh, PhD dissertations occasionally in selected topics on uh, Sukuma. Uh, so it would be very, I think, useful to engage uh, some of these uh, Sukuma speakers and Sukuma scholars as well. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, there we go. Um, so uh, Lutz Martin asks uh, if you think that the notion of language is sufficient for your work. Uh, no. I don't, I don't think that it's sufficient for our work. Um, and, and yeah, as opposed to this sort of idea of language ecology, this was, this was sort of something that Richard had mentioned. Um, I don't know if, if Richard has access to his, uh, to his um, microphone right now. That might be something that would be useful to do if Richard has access to a, a microphone. I know that he's listening. Um, he might be able to describe this a little bit more eloquently than me, but um, but yes, sort of this. Uh, I, I can sort of mention from notes that he uh, that that he that he's given me this idea of, you know, the 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 variety or the variation within speech communities. You know, it can give us this sort of crucial um, evidence of historical contact or lack thereof. So so Richard was mentioning to me. He said, you know, we have, we say Datoga is in sort of this profound contact relationship with Kushitic. But when we look at Azamjeg Datoga, which is a variety of Datoga, uh, really, you know, it didn't have contact with, or it didn't have any sort of um, deep contact, at least according to Richard. Um, well, right up. Oh, okay. You go ahead, Richard. I can well, hear you. I'm, I'm here now. So, all right. Okay. Uh, well, specifically, there are communities in, in the north, in the Mar region. So there are, there's an Asif Jain community there. There's some speakers who never left the region, at least in the past 100 years or so. Uh, and then there are also Rotiganga speakers there um, who don't really have the same history of extensive contact with the Iraq. So there might be some, um, some interesting... Uh, some interesting data to, to find there that could show some sort of differences in terms of uh, uh, language contact between Totoka groups and Hurak communities. So yeah, in terms of uh, the notion of language, um, definitely it's problematic when, when you, you think of contact, especially more recent contact, uh, you d wouldn't really expect every single member of a speech community to have come into contact with every single member of another speech community, but rather it's, it's subsets of those speech communities that are coming into contact in different ways, and different subsets get coming into contact in different ways. Um, and so you might see kind of on the periphery, there are some members of a speech community that really haven't experience the same kind of contact, but the effects of the contact of one of those subsets might then kind of reverberate throughout the entire speech community and then into other speech communities. So it really can become much more complex than this kind of simplistic notion of language A and language B are in contact, and that's uh, you know, evidenced uh, by the, this linguistic data, but actually it could be, uh, it could be much, uh, much more uh, detailed in terms of uh, who exactly is coming in contact with who uh, from each of these communities, rather than just entire speech communities coming in contact with each other. Thank you. Uh, I have another question from Alice Mitchell. Uh, she says one of the goals of the Rift Valley Network is to encourage exchange between Tanzanian-based and non-Tanzania-based scholars. How successful have we been in this first year, do you think? So I, I think I think that um, 
so if we look at if we look at the uh, if we look at the the sort of the statistics, uh, we see that there were um, there were about five presentations from uh, our Tanzanian scholars and. Uh, the remainder were from uh, scholars not based in Tanzania. Um, I think that I think that um, this is something that we can continue to work on. Um, I'm happy to see Tanzanian voices um, included in the work that we're doing. I think that it's I think that it's essential. Um, and yeah, I think that that's something that we can continue. So I would say that we have been, uh, that's something that we have seen a little bit of, but I would frankly like to see a lot more. And just to mirror that, yeah, I think um, considering that this was our first year and we're just kind of figuring things out, I think we, we did fairly well, I would say. Um, there are definitely some uh, technological challenges involved in, in getting increased participation from Tanzanian colleagues. Uh, so that's something that we've been kind of working through. And I think we've come up with a, a fairly reasonable uh, compromise in that Tanzanian colleagues can pre-record uh, their, their presentations if they don't have a, a, a solid internet connection. I think once we figured that out, then that kind of opened it up for a number of our colleagues to participate. But yes, we still would like, I, I think there's room for growth. We'd like to get more people involved, um, not only as presenters, but then also just uh, as, uh, as observers or participants in the, the webinars. Um, and I think that's uh, something we will continue to, to push for. Luckily, uh, you know, at this time, both Andrew and I uh, are, are continuing with documentation projects that require us to go back to Tanzania. So we will be able to uh, meet and work directly with some of our Tanzanian colleagues to, uh, to kind of promote uh, this kind of continued collaboration and, and, and involvement. Hannah Gibson has a related question on this issue. Um, so she says, um, "What are the obstacles? Might uh, what obstacles might there be uh, to for a broader range of folks accessing the network and being involved? Uh, I wonder if you might consider doing a short survey or some such to hear what people might also like to see from the network, particularly those in East Africa." Yeah. So sort of as a bit of a broader perspective, you know, what more? How can we sort of move to serve uh, our East African um, uh, colleagues um, and our East African members, um, you know, in ways beyond a webinar. And yeah, I think, I, think that that's, I think that that's really the only way. We have to ask them how they want to, how they want to engage with the, the network and, 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 how, uh, and how we think that we can best uh, work with them. Yeah, I'd agree with that too. And um, I think, uh, even aside from the, the sort of binary Tanzanian, non-Tanzanian distinction, just in, in terms of getting a kind of a wider diversity of, uh, of members involved, I think would be great. Getting more students involved, I think would also be wonderful. Uh, so it's, I mean, cause the, the network is still relatively new. Uh, I think it, it takes some time to establish what exactly the network is or can be and what goals it can serve and what, what it has to offer uh, each member or different kinds of members. Uh, and that's something that, yes, we'd like to get feedback on. And actually we, we did originally plan to send out a survey in late fall and then field work happened. Um, and now other things are happening, but uh, now that both of us will um, be in areas with really good internet connections, we'll, you'll probably be seeing that sent out soon. Uh, so we do want to get feedback from our members on how they think uh, things have been going and if they see room for improvement, if uh, the network hasn't been meeting their needs in certain ways, or if they feel that it could be meeting their needs uh, better, uh, or if it could be meeting the needs of, uh, of, of uh, other categories of members that hasn't been um, helping thus far. Uh, that's something that we'd like to hear. Uh, because uh, I'm sure, as you all know, this is uh, it's quite experimental in nature. This is something that is very organic and that's just sort of developed naturally and is going to continue to develop um, with uh, new initiatives like the uh, the reading group. Uh, we're seeing 
kind of new ways of uh, interacting and uh, sharing ideas and our knowledge of the, the languages of the Rift. Um, so if you have any ideas for things that we could do differently or things that we could try out for the first time, please let us know. We're, we're very interested and, and happy to receive that feedback. I have an additional question on this topic. Uh, I was just wondering with the, probably the, the broadest part of the network at this moment is the emailing list. So like roughly how many subscribers do we have and what's the spread there for Tanzania based or non Tanzania based? Oh, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know if we have the answer to that offhand. I don't know if Andrew knows. No, that's something that we'd need to look at um, afterwards. But I believe it's 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 larger. It's larger than fifty members, isn't it? I believe. So. Well, yeah, I, probably. I, 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 in terms of in terms of the spread, of yeah, in terms of the spread between uh, between people inside or outside of Tanzania, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but that's something that we could look at. Um, again, uh, that Richard has mentioned now that both of us are back from field work, albeit on different continents for various reasons. Uh, well, for one reason mainly. Um, uh, I think that we can probably um, we can probably get some closer answers. We can look at how we've been doing as a network, um, and yeah, we can we can look sort of outside of uh, outside of these webinars, which is the topic uh, of uh, of today's presentation. But yeah, we can look sort of outside of the webinars and uh, and see uh, and see uh, how we can grow this and how we can make it better. Uh, so I have another question from Alice Mitchell. She says, thank you for your answer to my earlier question. I also think you made a great start on this front too. Uh, great to be able to watch presentations from Tanzania and colleagues. Uh, and she wants to go back to Lutz's question and Richard comments. Um, I think I'd also like to be interesting uh, about how language ecologies are conceptualized from within local communities and not just from our scholarly perspective. Yeah, this is this is sort of another fascinating thing. And I think that this links to Tanzanian scholars and also scholars who are working on their own language groups. Um, the idea of how um, of how, uh, you know, a Gorwa person might view themselves uh, in relation to an Iraq speaking person, or even how uh, somebody from either of these communities would view themselves in a uh, in relation to a Datoga um, community. Uh, so, uh, you know, these things are very, very interesting and, and, and they're subtle and changeable and, and, uh, and contextual. And uh, these are things that, that flow into areas of linguistics that I uh, don't have much experience in, but I know that many of uh, uh, many people, many linguists do, and many, many people on our list do. And I think that this would really be sort of a, 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 a quite of a, a vital shot in the arm for the kind of work that we are doing. All right, then I think those were all the questions and comments for today. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page and entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. Uh, looking ahead, the next presentation in the webinar series will be given on Wednesday, April 8th by Alice Mitchell and it's titled uh, Social Linguistic Language Documentation in the Rift Valley, Current Practices and Future Prospects. Uh, with that, I would like to thank Andrew and Richard for this presentation and bringing up such very interesting topics to discuss. And of course, everyone else for participating today. Uh, and I hope to see everyone again at our next webinar and that everyone stays safe in these times.